Good afternoon. I'm Serena Oberstein, Executive Director of Jewish World Watch. Rooted in our own experiences of persecution, Jewish tradition and values, we were founded in 2004 when the silence about the genocide in Darfur was deafening. 16 years later, genocide and mass atrocity are still rampant, but we are not helpless in this fight. Jewish World Watch compels and enables people to stand up and take action through advocacy, education, and direct aid to combat mass atrocity worldwide. I wanna welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon for a dialogue with the diaspora, a conversation about the importance of advocacy, education, and galvanizing the community in the aftermath of genocide, particularly as it relates to Armenian Artsakh, also known as Nagorno-Karabakh. Today's conversation is a part of Impact in Action, a month of events focused on raising our collective voice to fight genocide. It's being produced in partnership with the Holocaust Museum Los Angeles and the Armenian National Committee to listen and learn how best we can support this transition and ensure that Armenians are safe and free from the aggression of their neighbors. I wanna thank our panelists, Senator Henry Stern, Armin Sahakian, Jordana Gessler, Ellen Asatrian, and our moderator, Glendale City Council member, Artie Kasakian. I also want to thank our Global Vision sponsors, Lawrence and Jane Z. Cohen and the Goldrich Foundation. We hope you'll be able to join us for more events throughout the month of Impact in Action. And then we hope that you'll be compelled to take action. Our dynamic moderator, Glendale City Council member, Artie Kasakian, has served the city of Glendale for almost 16 years in an elected capacity, a city clerk, and now as council member. Before assuming office, he was the Director of Government Relations and later the Executive Director of the Armenian National Committee of America, Western Region. Councilmember Kasakian was appointed by the California Senate Rules Committee to serve on the California New Motor Vehicle Board and the Language Accessibility Advisory Committee by Secretary of State Alex Padilla. Councilmember Kasakian is a student of history and the world present day. He has a deep understanding of diaspora communities Armenian and Jewish, our intersections and where we are unique. In every situation that I've had the honor of observing him, no matter how simple or complex, he shows up with integrity, compassion, and a genuine interest in getting to the truth. We are truly honored to have him guide us through this conversation today. Thank you so much, council member. Thank you, Serena, and thank you everyone for um, joining this important discussion. Uh, I wanna thank the Armenian National Committee of America Western Region, obviously, Jewish World Watch and your month of action and the Holocaust Museum of Los Angeles for putting a, this uh, incredible panel together and having this discussion at this important time. Um, as for you, Serena, I've known Serena Oberstein for well over 15 years through various capacities that, as that she served in the city of Los Angeles um, and also through just a friendship that blossomed from mutual interests, um, various campaigns that we worked on for candidates but it's interesting and in telling that um, we've always, our, our paths have always reconnected uh, on issues that such as um, uh, human rights, uh, genocide awareness and prevention, voter rights, and it's quite telling. It truly speaks to who you are, Serena, um, and what you fight for and what you fight against to make the world a better place. So thank you for that. In fact, um, to segue into our discussion today, um, the most recent conversation we had was when you were visiting a Glendale High School um, with Violins of Hope. Um, for those who may not know what Violins of Hope is, it's a collection of um, Holocaust-related string instruments in Tel Aviv, Israel, and the instruments uh, go on tour uh, and serve to educate and memorialize um, the lives of prisoners in the concentration camps through concerts, exhibitions, and other projects. And Serena, you brought one of those violins to Glendale um, through an organization you were working with. And, uh, you know, it was to a classroom in Glendale that was probably predominantly, I would say, well over 50% Armenian American students um, at Hoover High School. And as we listened to a performance and heard the story behind the violin and uh, all the other string instruments, um, I couldn't help but uh, think about the famous Armenian composer and um, uh, the Reverend uh, Father Gomidas. Uh, who was uh, probably the father of Armenian modern music, who chronicled the Armenian musical tradition. Um, during the Armenian genocide, he was rounded up with all the other community leaders um, who were executed 
many of whom were executed, very few survived. He was one of the few who was survived, whose life was spared, um, as the story goes, because someone recognized him from the Turkish authorities as the music teacher of their child. But unfortunately, the toll that took on uh, Father Gomidas was such that he um, was institutionalized um, in, uh, and passed away in Paris after having witnessed the horrors of the genocide and seeing so many of his compatriots um, slaughtered. Uh, and time and again, uh, whether it's experiences such as this or others, we see this commonality between the Jewish experience and the Armenian experience, um, sometimes in, in very happy and joyful and celebratory ways as, as uh, people who have had to search for a homeland and finally find a homeland um, are able to thrive, uh, survive, and, and celebrate their lives and their cultures. And, and at other times when we see um, attacks on Jewish people and Armenian people um, around the world, um, sometimes not in their own soil, um, sometimes in as uh, acts of anti-Semitism and hate crimes, as we've seen, unfortunately, even here in California against these two communities. But I think what um, uh, many Armenians have felt uh, as the events of the last uh, month and a half have unraveled in Armenia and Artsakh, the Republic of Artsakh, has, has created this existential struggle. Um, and we are here today with a panel of experts to talk about specifically the challenges that um, this Armenian, the Armenian community faces, um, similarities with the Jewish community, how as communities we can collaborate, work um, together, educate, um, activate communities to action. So we have a great panel of speakers with us. I wanna thank them um, all. Um, we have, you see the names of the individuals there, but I'll be introducing them not in order of importance, but um, in the order that they will be speaking. So we have joining us Jordana Gessler. She is the Vice President of Education and Exhibits at the Holocaust Museum of Los Angeles, a great institution. She has worked at the Holocaust Museum for well over six years and has extensive experience and knowledge in Holocaust studies and education, having interned at Yad Vashem in Israel. Her knowledge on Holocaust education is invaluable to this panel and we thank her for her time. We also have joining us State Senator Henry Stern, um, who is a sixth generation Californian and native of the greater Los Angeles area, who has represented nearly 1 million residents of the 27th Senate District since first being elected to serve the 27th District uh, in November of 2016. He is a strong voice for environmental protection, but also someone who has visited both Israel and Armenia and whom I consider personally, a person who builds bridges between communities, constituents, and issues of common interest. Um, I, we appreciate him taking time away from his busy schedule to join us. We have also with us um, Armen Sahakian, uh, hard, one of the hardest working people in the Armenian community, especially at this time, who's serving as the ANCA, Armenian National Committee of America, Western Region Executive Director. In this role, Sahakian oversees the far-ranging projects and initiatives of the ANCA Western Region, including grassroots community development, organizing public policy advocacy, coalition building, media relations, and coordination of goals and priorities among the 28 local chapters in the Western region. Um, and if you're thinking, well, um, how can one person do that? Um, that talk tells you what an amazing person he is and uh, how adept he is at what he does. So thank you, Armin, for taking time to join this panel. And we have with us Ellen Asadrian, someone who also held the same position as Armin Sahakian. Um, not too long ago, Chair of Diaspora Action Center, which serves as the official bridge of the Armenian community in the United States by fostering collaboration and coordination for critical resources, action alerts, and community information in support of the Armenian American community across the U.S., Armenia, and Artsakh. Ellen, thank you for your time as well. Um, with that, I want to turn um, this uh, discussion over to Jordana, um, who will be sharing a few words with us about just the defining genocide, the importance of educating our next generation, and just generally how we talk about genocide. Jordana. Uh, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Jordana Gessler, and I work at Holocaust Museum LA. We appreciate you inviting us for this education opportunity, as this is a difficult and challenging time in our world. Um, injustice has no place in our mission, our work, and the world that we envision. As a Holocaust Museum, we stand in steadfast resolve against those who harm others because of who they are and what their race, color, gender, sexuality, or religious beliefs might be. The Holocaust is arguably one of the most well-known genocides in the world. 
In fact, for many scholars, it is the fundamental example of genocide, the model to which other genocides are compared in contrast. Understanding the actions that took place during the Holocaust is important to the wider scope of genocide research. However, in the last century, there have been many cases of mass violence and genocides that took place before and after the Holocaust. It is important for us to learn from all of these, but never compare suffering. The, compar the comparisons of suffering and victimhood can quickly cheapen the study of genocides. We must find a way to link the Holocaust and other genocides without lessening any genocidal event or providing a Eurocentric argument. We can connect genocides through the relational conception of genocide. If genocide on the most basic level is something that kills more than just people, but kills community, tradition, and culture, and if there is this collectively existence beyond human beings. So what is genocide and what is the importance of defining it? Studying genocide history is a difficult task to navigate for a multitude of diverse reasons. Genocides have taken place in almost every crevice of the world, most likely with the exception of Antarctica um, and in a host of different settings. The term genocide was collectively accepted but not originally conceptualized in the wake of the Holocaust. The word was originally created by a man named Raphael Lemkin. He was a Polish Jewish lawyer who was best known for coining the word genocide but also initiating the genocide convention. Lemkin coined the word genocide in 1943 but it was really published in his work in 1944 and he created the word stemming from genos, which is Greek for family or tribe, and side, which is Latin for killing. Lemkin was originally born in, 19, in 1909. Um, he was interested in the history of mass murder and community suffering based on differences. Growing up in Eastern Europe, he knew all too well the impact of being part of the Jewish minority. Through a lot of his early writings, uh, he demonstrates a belief central to his thinking throughout his life. The suffering of Jews in Eastern Poland was part of a larger pattern of injustice and violence that stretched back throughout history and around the world. Following World War I, Lemkin, a lawyer, became interested in the concept of crime, later developing the concept of genocide based on the Armenian experience at the hands of the Ottoman Turks. He believed that if one person could be held responsible for murdering another person, then a community should be held responsible for murdering another community. So his definition of genocide was published in his book, Axis Rule in Occupied Europe um, in 1944. And he had a, a very large um, and long definition, but basically he wrote that by genocide, we mean the destruction of an ethnic group. Generally speaking, genocide does not necessar necessarily mean the immediate destruction of a nation, except when accomplished by mass killings of all members of a nation. It is intended rather to signify a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of essential foundations of the life of national groups. With the aim of annihilating the groups themselves, the objectives of such a plan could be a part of political and social institutions, of culture, of language, national feelings, religion, and the economic existence of a national group and the destruction of the personal security, liberty, health, dignity, and even the lives of the individuals belonging to such groups. And that's typically the understanding and definition that we have today, although it's been expanded um, throughout the last few decades. And another monumental moment when we're looking at genocide education is when Gregory Stratton developed the 10 stages of genocide. And I think it's really important to understand these 10 stages, most specifically that the second to last stage is murder and the final stage being denial. So what is taking place in those first eight stages of genocide um, that we are given the opportunity to sort of stop or prevent it from happening. And through understanding those stages of classification, symbolism, discrimination, dehumanization, organization, polarization, preparation and persecution, eventually murder and denial, we can better work to help prevent genocide. Genocide is predictable, but not inevitable. There's always a set of circumstances that create the climate in which genocides take place. And at each state, preventative measures can be taken to stop the process. So how do we grow from this? How do we heal as a victim group? Um, I think that it's really important that we work to better identify moments of discrimination and work to stop it and identify it as it's happening. We reach out to other victim groups, other institutions, um, our fellow neighbors, we find common ground and we learn to respect each other. Although the unprecedented actions of the Holocaust did shape the definition and awareness of genocide on a universal scale, 
Um, it is not the only genocide that has taken place. It was not the first and it was not the last. And drawing comparisons between different state perpetual, perpetuated mass murders will help us in attempting to grasp a better definition of what constitutes genocide and how to prevent it. Furthermore, the comparison of these different events is not sufficient enough, but cross comparison of genocidal events prior to and following the Holocaust is paramount to reach this goal. That is why conversations like we're having today are so important for education in a community. At Holocaust Museum LA, we believe that education can and will lead to a more dignified future. We look forward to working together to fulfill this mission. Thank you. Thank you, Jordana. Um, I want to uh, uh, remind everyone that if you do have questions to put them in the Q&A box that we have um, in the bottom of the panel, there's uh, right in the center of your screen if you're on, um, most of you are on the same platform, we're all using the same platform. So if you see it, you can put it there and um, we will try to answer them throughout this discussion. Thank you for, for that um, very uh, appropriate, I think, succinct uh, synopsis of um, you know, genocide and different steps of genocide. Um, in addition to the education component of this, uh, we also have included advocacy. And when we think of advocacy, oftentimes many of us are called to action uh, with our um, community leaders, our elected leaders. Um, we write petitions, we uh, circulate them on social media, um, and the recipients of those are uh, one of those recipients of those types of petitions is our next speaker. Um, uh, we already gave a brief bio, but I'd like um, our uh, esteemed guest, Senator Henry Stern, to now speak about the advocacy uh, side of this. Um, uh, the, his personal experiences as well, having been uh, to Armenia and visited the country um, and been an advocate in the state Senate, as well as why is it important to reach out to uh, our elected officials. Senator Stern. Uh, thank you, Councilmember. Uh, I guess I'll call you Artie for today. I could be Henry for today. Jordana, um, so good to see you. And Serena, thanks for um, being the consummate connector. Jewish World Watch like, was already this powerful entity and, and brand for justice, but then, I don't know, I, I just, I'm so impressed with all the all the outreach and education you all have been doing over the past several months and um, through this election cycle and just bringing interesting thought leaders together. So honored to be on the the circuit here because it's a really a it's yeah good quality and curated information combined with really good people. It's very healing, I think, for us right now, um, just to be together in some way. So I mean that's sort of. Today, in terms of you know answering your question already uh, about why connect why connect with your elected official, um, it's why connect with anybody um, to to build something real to actually have a shared experience or share your experience and break ourselves out of the bubbles these these sort of bubbles we're living in more and more these days right I mean two years ago it's hard to break out and feel like an advocate because but that's because you don't want to make this flight to Sacramento or you don't really want to pick up the phone or the email or you don't really know what that connection's like. Like, why would you talk to a state senator? Most people don't know who their state senator is. Um, we like to think everyone knows who we are, by the way. That's sort of the other, that's the flip side. We're a very big deal to ourselves. Turns out tremendous amount of power over the state education system, over even things like international relations that aren't technically in our purview, but, um, you know, we run the fifth largest economy in the world here in the state of California, and we're home to culturally the most diverse state in our region, um, the richest cultural heritage anywhere uh, in the world, I think, um, just in terms of the, like the heart of Israel lives in Los Angeles, too. The heart of Armenia also lives in Los Angeles, too. I mean, it's and it's true with so many other cultures and constituencies. Um, so we're a really special place. So this is a very special group however many people are joining today um, in terms of a megaphone for morality. Um, you know, I was listening to Jordana, uh, your step one in that genocide definition, was it classification? I, I, I was trying to 
catch it in yes the step the first step is classification classification so you know i've been we lost um we lost a, a great moral leader um last week um from the jewish community rabbi lord jonathan Sachs, and he he talks about um what i think is maybe a precursor to that classification step which is this this great loneliness this atomization that we're going through um, where your tribe itself gets smaller and smaller and basically down to zero. And more and more people live alone and community is less of a, of, a, of a concept and people don't really feel together and we associate ourselves. Then we start to atomize and, and define ourselves of what we're not or who we're against and the whole country sort of fracturing. And one of the reasons I bring that up is just because um, the notion of sort of intersectionality or shared heritage or shared memory or collective memory that you were talking about, Jordana, and Artie, that you and Ellen and um, Nora over at the ANC West and um, uh, Senator Portentino built, went on a sort of empathy mission with me to Armenia and built my morality out about our shared memory of suffering. I mean, they're actually not even just a, a, sh a shared experience. It's they're actually connected too. I, I learned on that trip um, who taught the Nazis how to wipe a people out um, and where that came from. Um, but I think before before all the planning, I think you said preparation was like the ninth step, maybe something or late eighth or ninth eighth. So before you really get to those mechanics of, of war or whatever they're masked as that we, we've seen play out in Armenia and now uh, in the Artsakh region as of late, um, however they're sort of spun uh, in the end, the, the, the preparation stage comes way after a greater uh, breaking in society. Uh, and I, I hate to say it, but I think we're at risk of it too in this country. Um, we feel more divided than we've ever felt. And it's very dangerous uh, because it, it prevents us from doing basic things, cooperative acts together. It, it fractures society. But today, I don't know. It's a very strange time to meet and try to preach some kind of hope about what um, empathizing with the Armenian community and the Armenian diaspora means and especially when people are being killed right now so it's really it's hard to do it i i have trouble you know celebrating any peace even right now or any treaties because it's guaranteed by such um complicated and uh suspect moral actors themselves i, I wish america itself stepped up mm -hmm. so what i think jewish world watch is doing here today is like this sort of constant reawakening of morality like I, I work in politics, so you need to advocate to a senator because I can, in theory, say, run a genocide education bill and impact the broader curriculum training standards. It's actually something we're looking into doing. We'd love some input on that, how we respond in a not divisive way, a little different than maybe say how the ethnic studies debate played out in the end, um, maybe a reset there. But I'm, I'm, a, I'm a senator, right? I work in politics, which, re, which is really a space of compromise and posture and a lot of spin but morality is sort of a separate playing field and uh it's not really optional like i i think everyone should be voting but you actually can decide whether to cast that ballot but you don't have a choice whether to believe in right and wrong you're making moral choices all the time and so i i just think when we learn about um what happened in armenia um and when we learn what happened to Jews across Europe um, in, in their respective genocides, it's not even that we learn about ourselves or where we come from, which is increasingly um, difficult to connect with, right? When you live on this and you sort of just feel like you're in, again, you're in a bubble, like you don't really come from somewhere. Um, as, as much as that's important to the individual, I think once, the, once people who aren't like us, once non-Jews and non-Armenians 
start to learn from this history. Once you have a young Latino student at Reseda High School who knows of neither, you know, when I went and spoke to their classroom, he raised his hand, didn't know what Auschwitz was, also had not heard of the Armenian genocide. And this is like, you know, kid on student council. This is not like, oh, hey, I got my head in the clouds. And you look at the polling, and the data shows that much that we don't we don't remember collectively. But there is no history, right? You just Google it. We're beyond history. That's a very dangerous environment we live in, where there is no history and hateful things can be said and tucked away, and aggressions like we're seeing right now can be somehow tolerated as sort of someone else's problem. We're in that step zero right now. Um, we, we're also maybe step one, I think you could say classification. I think you keep going. I think America's in, I don't know where you'd, I'd be curious to hear what you, you had to say about that, Jordan, or any of our other panelists, what step we might be at. Well, let me, um, let me uh, give some of the, let me have all the panelists uh, give their input um, on the day's topic. And then afterwards, there's a lot of questions. We have questions coming in right now, Sander, for you um, as great. well, especially uh, regarding the ethnic curriculum. Um, that was created in Sacramento, and I know you'll have a few things to say uh, about that. Um, and I want to thank you for, for being uh, someone who always lends an ear to those um, who sometimes in the larger sphere of, of people seeking attention for their various interests um, seem voiceless. And it's true that if you live in uh, California or you live in Southern California specifically, whether it's your district or you mentioned Senator Anthony Portentino, um, inevitably, you've come across someone who's Armenian, you know someone who's Armenian, you know someone who's Jewish, um, as you go to other places um, outside of some of the cosmopolitan metropolitan areas, um, it, it becomes uh, fewer and far in between. But it's not surprising that even here in a place like Los Angeles, you will run into people who, um, for whatever reasons, um, are unaware of, of human history. Um, so speaking of what is happening right now, history as it is unraveling, um, in the Armenian highland in an area some will call the South Caucasus. I want to turn to our next panelist, Armin Sahakian, who is the executive director of the Armenian National Committee of America Western Region. Um, now, Armin, what's brought us here today um, obviously is a call to action, but also it's to discuss the recent events in the Republic of Artsakh. Uh, this was a region um, that during Soviet times was known as Nagorno-Karabakh, um, ethnically Armenian, um, and has been for over a thousand years. And, um, you know, it was the flashpoint of one of the bloodiest conflicts in the post-Soviet era um, when um, Azerbaijan tried to suppress the ethnic enclave, the autonomous oblast's ability to um, have independence and reunite with Armenia. Um, and since then, uh, after 1994, when there was a very tenuous ceasefire, it's been violated many times three times at least recently, twice this year, um, and the most recent one resulting in uh, probably one of the most bloodiest in the last 26 years um, with attacks coming from Azerbaijan aided by the Republic of Turkey and aided by jihadist mercenaries from Syria. This is all facts um, from international observers and major media outlets. So can you give us, you know, I, I just summed it up really uh, quickly, but could you tell us, like, how is it that we have ended up here now? Um, what is the history, and what is it that ANCA is doing to raise awareness about this? Sure. Well, thank you so much, Artie. Um, let me, before I begin, uh, also echo um, everyone that spoke so far in thanking Jewish World Watch um, for putting all of this together. I've been uh, proud to have worked with Jewish World Watch for a number of years, including organizing the Walk to End Genocide in Washington, D.C., so very much familiar and appreciative of all the work, and of course, the L.A. Holocaust Museum as well. Um, it's, it's a true honor to be part of this illustrious panel, and thanks for having me. Um, and as we were talking, um, I honestly um, don't even know where to begin because there's so much to unpack here in a matter of five minutes, and I was thinking of all of our April 24th um, commemoration events, uh, commemorating the Armenian genocide, attending Holocaust memorial events, and otherwise. And we always, one thing that is a constant is the chant to never again allow such atrocities to take place. We always say 1915 never again, Holocaust never again. We need to really put that into action. And yet I think uh, we collectively failed in that call. Um, 
about 45, 46 days ago when Azerbaijan launched um, its full-scale military aggression against the civilians of Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh, formerly known as Nagorno-Karabakh. And to maybe give a very quick historical uh, tour de force, of course, Ardi already mentioned this is a historically Armenian area, um, even declassified CIA documents from the 80s attest to this, um, that Armenians have lived here. It's their indigenous land that was um, stolen and illegally transferred over to Soviet Azerbaijan by Joseph Stalin himself in the 1920s as part of the Soviet divide and rule um, strategy. And the Armenians unfortunately became victim to this uh, for 70 years of the Soviet occupation, but beyond that. So the evil plan of Joseph Stalin is still in action today, um, despite the fact that people of Artsakh spoke um, in 1991 and throughout the Soviet occupation, trying to live free of discrimination, free of occupation um, in, a, in a country uh, and under government of their own choosing. And yet Azerbaijan has refused um, to allow that to happen. And um, one thing that I think differentiates the Armenian genocide with the Holocaust is the fact that the perpetrators never truly face justice for it. Um, I always run this parallel. Germany wouldn't be the country it is today had it not faced the consequences, rehabilitated itself as a society, as a country uh, for all the evil that took place during the Holocaust. Um, and we unfortunately have not had that with Turkey. So uh, Armenian genocide, as we speak, is still ongoing. We're still in the 10th stage of genocide of denial. Um, and Turkey and Azerbaijan calling each other one nation, two states, are really the manifestation of that today. You know, we are facing, uh, Armenia, Artsakh are facing neighbors to the west and east that to this very day deny the veracity of the Armenian genocide, continue to desecrate our monuments and monasteries and cultural heritage, and are undertaking further ethnic cleansing as we speak. I will bring one example of Nakhichevan, the uh, area currently under control of Azerbaijan, an ancient Armenian uh, cemetery in Julfa with thousands of Hachkars, monasteries all throughout, currently turned to dust. By 2006, in a 10 year campaign, the government of Azerbaijan uh, completed its cultural genocide of over 28,000 Armenian cultural uh, monuments. So to Armenians, there is no question that this is a continuation of the genocidal policy started in 1915 and even beyond that, before that, uh, because we're still seeing these different um, episodes throughout history repeating themselves. And the latest uh, was, of course, the aggression started uh, on September 27th by Azerbaijan, but also assisted by the full force of the Republic of Turkey, the second largest NATO army um, after the United States, and hired mercenary terrorists transported from Syria and other parts of the Middle East. So in our minds, of course, there's no question uh, that this is the continuation of the Armenian genocide. And just a few days ago, the Armenian government facing an overwhelming force and pressure had to basically sign a disgraceful document uh, that we're trying to combat as we speak. Um, because allowing this to uh, proceed uh, will only mean further erasure of Armenian civilizational heritage in uh, ancient lands of Artsakh. We already even saw uh, the cultural minister of Azerbaijan put out a tweet uh, trying to already erase Armenian um, history from um, monastery of Dadivank, trying to uh, portray it as an ancient Caucasian Albanian um, monastery, which of course is nothing but uh, trying to erase um, Armenian uh, cultural um, heritage in this area. So uh, this is a very a tense, tragic situation. Um, I think the world at large betrayed the Armenians yet again. Uh, the never again pledge didn't really manifest itself in any tangible way. We're certainly very fortunate and lucky to have friends all throughout the world, allies, including Jewish World Watch, including others who spearheaded letter campaigns, who spearheaded a number of activities to raise awareness, to try to uh, bring people's attention to this matter. But of course, that was not enough. So as ANCA, as we speak, we're currently working on making sure that the United States and the civilized world uh, comes to the rescue of the Armenians of Artsakh. Uh, we're facing a humanitarian crisis of colossal magnitude. Over 100,000 people have been forcibly pushed out of their homes, of their ancestral homelands. So something needs to be done and something needs to be done right away. And so that's what we're working on, trying to make sure the United States has a seat at the table uh, to advocate for the oppressed, to make sure that the Never Again Pledge is actually put into action. So I know I am about at five minute mark, so I'll be happy to um, revisit any points. Um, down the road. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Armin. Um, that was very important. Uh, I think you summarized it, although we could sit here and spend an entire hour to discuss 
um, really the, the whole history of the region of how we uh, arrived here, even predating um, Stalin and, and the interplay of, of major superpowers and Armenia being caught uh, at the crossroad of empires. Um, and I'll tell you, it is very much, again, when we look at the parallels between Armenian history and Jewish history, even this conflict here as it was uh, happening, I kept thinking of the Yom Kippur War, um, which, you know, was when Israel was fighting off um, the United Forces of Egypt, Syria, um, and I believe it was Jordan as well, um, just really uh, taking on what seemingly the world um, on its own. Um, same thing here, Armenia wasn't just fighting Azerbaijan, it was fighting combined forces of multiple nations that um, had some sort of stake in this. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, because of COVID, because of just general disinterest, because of the malaise of 26 years of not really coming um, to the table and, and forcing Azerbaijan or uh, um, a, a, any of the other players to come to an agreement and excluding the people of Artsakh directly, right? That's one of the issues, the people in Nagorno-Karabakh we're not never allowed to have a seat at the table for the negotiations. We are where we are today. Um, I want to now allow Elena Satarian, who's the chair of a diaspora action center, to uh, talk about how um, she has been harnessing the energy of the diaspora to be able to get this message out to people. Um, Ellen, what have you been doing and involved in over the last 45, 46 days? And what will you continue to be doing in the coming weeks and months? So um, before I start, uh, I'd like to also thank Jewel, Jewish World Watch, uh, specifically Serena Oberstein for her friendship and dedication to being a partner in our cause, uh, not just in this moment, but throughout the years. Um, I think one thing that we've definitely faced, um, especially in the last 45, 46, 47 days is an unprecedented level of activism um, and to be able to harness that uh, activism and guide it in the right direction um, has been a critical point, not just in the United States, but really globally. Um, the concept of the Diaspora Action Center came uh, because there were individuals who had never been active and had never been part of any organization that all of a sudden came to the front lines offering their professional services. You had youth um, taking to the streets for protests. Um, and individuals to social media. And to be able to help guide and provide resources to those individuals was critical. Um, and to help amplify the efforts of organizations like the ANCA, like the ARS, um, and efforts that were really needed in Hayastan and, and in Armenia. So um, it's been a, a, it's been to, initially was just putting together work groups of people, pods of people, that had kind of taken the cause on to themselves and creating a space for organizations and individuals to, to come together. So we're not duplicating the efforts. Um, we're trying to coordinate and collaborate on, on the, the different areas that this cause needed. Um, so, you know, whether it's traditional media space to um, helping organize protests. Um, I think initially, if you, if you remember, um, the youth were taking to the streets and really closing down freeways but really there was no proper messaging um, included in that. So to be able to guide that energy in the right direction, you know, taking on, um, for example, a call from the ANCA to um, uh, call on uh, Senator uh, McCarthy to take action, for example, was one of those things where, you know, we took that call and um, uh, provided the resources and direction to uh, the protest groups for them to organize it and have proper messaging. You know, the, the media itself has not been on our side, similar to the world. And to, you know, when you don't have an organized effort or you're not helping navigate that energy, um, you add <laughs> um, additional misinformation. Um, and so um, one of the big things also was the social media component. Um, we're obviously been fighting Azeri bots. Um, <laughs> and misinformation. And so um, galvanizing the community really worldwide um, um, and working with counterparts in France and Australia and, and Armenia to have a global unified message, uh, but also uh, our efforts, of course, uh, deal with the United States. And so 
um, how we incorporate that messaging and content um, uh, collaboratively uh, globally. Thank you, um, and thank you to everyone. Um, so one of the things that I've heard and comes up uh, is this idea that, well, um, it's not the Azeris that are doing the ethnic cleansing, it's the Armenians that are doing the ethnic cleansing, that if um, Azerbaijan did not, it, it, and it seems like, just bear with me, because although it seems like a silly argument, and you sometimes hear it, um, it's, I think it's part of how people rationalize genocides and even the Holocaust. Um, it's to obviously dehumanize a group, but then to see them as a threat to their own existence. Um, and one of the things that has been hard for me to understand is the, the fear or, of Azeris or Turks that see this nation, Armenia's population is a slightly less than 3 million. Azerbaijan's is close to 10 million. Um, so almost five times uh, the size of Armenia combined with Turkey, which is ethnically, they're both the same people, same language, common heritage, different, um, uh, one is Shiite, one is Sunni, but in terms of Islam, but, um, you know, this fear that, uh, you know, and I've heard this from Turks that, well, we, we've been told that the Armenians wanted to eradicate the Turks. And, and it's just like, if you were to assume that uh, argument, it's mathematically, it means it's impossible, right? So, or, or about uh, the Jewish people in Europe, uh, uh, destroying Germany from within. So how, how Jordana, do you categorize that type of um, comments and what can people do to combat them? Um, and then um, after Jordana, maybe you in perhaps, uh, um, I would like to know, Henry, how you've been uh, approached by individuals within these communities that claim themselves to be the vi victims um, versus uh, being part of an aggressor state. And Armin and Ellen, if you guys can maybe talk about how you've been responding to it in the community and what others can do. Jordana? Yeah, so, I mean, I think, well, first of all, when we look, I always say this um, at programs, when we look at the Holocaust, we're not looking at Jewish history, we're looking at human history. We're looking at the history and the capacity of human beings to do the utmost horrific things to one another. And so I do think it's really important to have this cross dialogue of looking at these different examples of genocide, because even what you just mentioned, if you look at the Armenian genocide and also the genocide in Rwanda, there was already a history of ethnic te ethnic tension, excuse me, between both the Armenians and the Turks, and also the Hutu and the Tutsi. And both the Young Turks and the Hutu power employed a propaganda tactic, which is what you're referring to, more, um, which is called the accusation in the mirror, um, meaning that the party in which is using terror will accuse the enemy of using terror. And that's a really dangerous sort of tactic because it's fear mongering. And it's also very similar to what you mentioned how in Nazi Germany, there was a lot of propaganda saying that Jews were tainting the blood of the nation. They were carrying diseases. Um, and this need to, to fear monger um, is what allows tension and violence to grow. So when it comes to activism and education and advocacy, it's always very important to read many sources on a topic, to begin to identify the difference between freedom of speech and hate rhetoric, um, and really see you know, when these tensions are, are coming about, is it a process of dehumanization? Um, are those, is there a specific group of people who are being perceived as different? Um, are they treated as less than? Are they losing rights? Are they being restricted? And instead of just listening to people say, oh, this group is perpetuating violence, we all need to do our work in researching and dissecting and looking for the truth within all of that. And I think looking at past genocides, um, like the Armenian genocide, like the Holocaust, like Rwanda, will really help us better identify when these tactics are being in use. Thank you. Now, uh, Henry, the individuals within the Azeri government and the Turkish government have not spared any expense in trying to ha hire um, hired guns and advocates and, and lobbyists and PR firms. Um, curious to know how they have interfaced with you. I know you also spent some time on Capitol Hill um, and worked uh, for uh, the state legislature before you were uh, elected to your position. So, you know, what has been your interaction with some of these groups that try to influence and um, bring in a revisionist uh, look of history. I, uh, 
I don't want to disappoint, but I'm, I don't know if I'm a big enough deal to have attracted really the uh, full brunt of advocacy out there, especially maybe because people think my purview in state government isn't as central. I mean, I guess my observations have been more so um, the, the battle for the truth um, out there in um, softer forums, if you will. Um, less so, I mean, like, you know, when I signed on to, I sit on the um, Armenian Art Sox Select Clips Committee in the Senate. Um, and we, we put out a letter, as did the Jewish Caucus. I don't know. Um, I think there's, there's pretty strong consensus right now condemning the violence and the aggression and where it's really been focused. So um, maybe it's because some of our members of Congress in the region made it easy for us to and stepped up first. And maybe it's, you know, it's the case that your Adam Schiff out there or your Brad Sherman took more of the heat, if you will. Um, but what I've seen is, is more so the, the broader campaign around um, the Israel uh, Azerbaijan, the strength of that relationship. That that's really where I just have seen the emphasis more so is um, the economic um, necessity of it, the strategic necessity um, that uh, as a as a Jewish you know young leader um, just to 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 be to be uh, to not tread into this area, in other words, to, to not mess with those relations because it's it's an important strategic relationship with the state of Israel. And I just, that, that was sort of what I was, I guess laying groundwork for earlier when I was talking about morality is that um, economics is sort of the, the third strain, right? There's politics, there's morality, and there's economics. I, I don't think economics has anything to do with morality either. And so when we hear about, um, and it's at various, you know, forums or my father-in-law happens to have been a survivor of the Holocaust. And uh, he's made it on to the uh, Museum of the Holocaust speaking circuit. I think they're sick of him now. He's sort of become an institution out there. Jordan, I should tell you, we are going to donate Joshua's plumbing van to the park outside of the Holocaust Museum. I don't think you knew about that endowment, but it's, it's coming your way. Um, but you know, with Joshua, he's a public figure on this. And so um, I know he's been visited in different ways and talking about the history of sort of shared heritage. Um, I, I've seen it much more so as a uh, friendship diplomacy mission as opposed to an outright um, misinformation campaign. Although, I don't know, it's more secondhand in that regard. I'd say the biggest issue really has been um, as a Jewish legislator, and as an advocate for, um, you know, the same kinds of things Jewish World Watch pushes for, this this sense of cautiousness that we as Jews have to have when approaching this issue that I don't think um, our morality allows. I don't think you should approach something cautiously like telling the truth about genocide. I think you have to just tell the truth, and I think that that that's the part that concerns me the most. Yeah. Is this. We, we ought not ever be tepid as, as Jews. I mean, as the Israeli government is one entity, but we in the Jewish diaspora, if you have, that's what you want to call it, we have the same obligation. So to stand with you guys. And when things um, get down, you know, you go, you go back to who's left, who's the last one standing, and um, we've been there before. So I, I, I hope that's not, I mean, I'm just trying to give you my, my most candid answer, but it, it's, it's, um, I think it's probably more pointed in Congress. I also, I stick so closely to Senator Portantino that maybe just being in that sort of Glendale Burbank orbit um, and, and having visited the country and gone through that experience, maybe I'm just not on the list anymore. Um, but I, I don't know, going on that trip and sort of working directly with the Armenian government, actually getting to meet with the prime minister um, and sit down there and understand that. Um, I have zero inhibition about um, forming a, that formal friendship, um, even if it's not, doesn't have the weight say of uh, uh, a federal treaty or something. Thank, thank you. Um, so Armin and Alan, how have you, uh, how have Armenian organizations, this Diaspora Action Center 
countered the or or been able to balance the need for educating people about a topic that most Americans uh, unfortunately are unfamiliar about, which is what's taking place in Artsakh and the atrocities and potential for genocide versus also countering the misinformation from Azerbaijan and from uh, Turkey and other sources regarding what's happening. If, Armin, if I, if I may, uh, I actually want to take a step back because um, one of the key points to, uh, to talk about uh, as it relates to both the PR firms and the Azeri government and Turkish government having an influence over our elected officials, uh, during my time at the ANC Western Region, when we would visit um, the, the Western states, um, I have to tell you that regardless of the time that I went um, uh, to, our, to the different capitals, uh, the Azeri Consul General uh, had been there a week before. Their hired guns had been there trying to affect our legislators. Um, Time and again, um, resolutions that had misinformation and false statements, trying to rewrite history uh, within American politics uh, was consistent. We would usually find out about them 24 hours before the anti-Armenian or anti Artsakh resolution was being presented. In places like uh, Boise, Idaho and Arizona, um, the like really just Hawaii. Um, and I'll tell you that I, I think the the reason that we were able to successfully um, stop a lot of these efforts is because a truth is on our side and we had Americans reaching out to their elected officials to uh, talk about uh, the truth and provide history. Um, and, you know, time and again, there were actually elected officials throughout these states that um, signed on to these resolutions or co-sponsored them without ever doing fact checking. And uh, many times we actually saw uh, them um, submit an apology as they were <laughs> uh, taking uh, uh, taking that resolution off calendar. So um, I think maybe California is different because of the large Armenian uh, American population here. Um, but this misinformation did not start, um, you know, 47 days ago. It didn't start at the beginning of this year. It's been an ongoing effort and escalated in in recent years. Most definitely, I can say at, at the very least. The last six, seven years, you know, I've personally witnessed that where, um, and I think that that's a really important uh, thing to grasp the, the amount of money that is being dumped in American politics uh, to change uh, and rewrite history um, and how we collectively uh, need to uh, put an emphasis on uh, getting these uh, companies to drop their contracts uh, in representing really dictators in the United States. Thank you, uh, Armin. I want you to actually maybe address this next question. Actually, it goes out to everyone. Um, it's from David Lenga, uh, who is a survivor um, of the Holocaust. Thank you, David, for your question. Um, considering the lessons of history and the way the world functions in our own day, one can't escape the hard truth that justice is the will of the stronger. Sad, but true. How can society fight this? Armin, I'll let you take the first crack at answering this and then have okay. everyone else chime in. It's a tall thank order. You. And thank you, Mr. Lenga, for the question. And thank you, Artie. Um, I think, I mean, the Armenians, and I think this may maybe resonate with the Jewish community as well, have always been in this David versus Goliath struggle for majority of our history. We've always been the underdog. We've always been facing these, uh, you know, oversized issues or, or problems. And, and I mean, the same goes to the Armenian genocide, the same goes right now with the Artsakh issue. I think the, the biggest thing is to obviously never give up on your struggle. And secondly, try to find allies and uh, get stronger that way, um, especially with groups uh, with similar backgrounds or similar experiences. That's, that's I think, been the key for, for the Armenian community. Um, and in more, in many instances, we've of course come out victorious. So just the sheer size of a community um, doesn't negate its will or its uh, determination to keep forging forward. Um, Armenians, uh, just like Jews, are one of the most ancient um, peoples in the world, um, and we still do exist, and we still 
have statehood on the map that we can pinpoint, unlike many others, even nations that have completely been erased from, from uh, time immemorial. Um, so I think it's that fire in our hearts, that, that will to live um, and live in peace and harmony uh, with our neighbors. Unfortunately, of course, we've been um, in a way cursed um, having um, a government, two governments uh, next door that still vehemently deny any wrongdoing. I mean, are they kind of going back to your original question? Um, Armenians were um, second-class citizens in the Ottoman Empire. Let's not forget that. You know, with no basic rights um, that they could hold in court or in society. And the genocide didn't begin in 1915. There were the Hamidian massacres. There was the Adana massacre. There was the genocide. And this is basically, in my mind, the biggest historical cover-up, um, as far as I'm concerned, because it was also not just the Armenians that fell victim to the genocide, but it was the Greeks and the Assyrians as well, the indigenous Christian populations of the Ottoman Empire. Um, so it's been this cover up because there is the fear of trying to face justice for it. Let's not forget the thousands of churches and monasteries, private property, um, everything that was confiscated from the Armenians, from the citizens against which the government perpetrated this genocide and, and, and is still trying to uh, cover, it, cover it up to this very day. So um, I think it's that um, um, commitment to historical truth and justice that I, at least my generation carries or our generation carries because we know our grandfathers or great grandfathers had to endure the death marches in the Syrian desert and the least we can do um, and the least we owe them is to keep the fight going and try to get truth and justice for this crime. Absolutely. Thank you Armin for that. I want to give uh, Senator Stern an opportunity to respond but before I turn it over to uh, Henry uh, you mentioned about two ancient peoples, um, the Jewish and the Armenian uh, tribes, and you know uh, there's actually only few nations mentioned in the Torah in the Old Testament that are still in existence today, and Armenia is one of them. Uh, I think it's Isaiah 37, 38, when you read just that passage alone, never mind the fact that Noah's Ark came to land on Mount Ararat, um, which is in present-day Turkey. Um, but, you know, Armenia is mentioned throughout uh, um, in, in a very positive light, um, and there is that commonality. Um, and as far as, you know, the fighting injustice, uh, I'm reminded of another story from the Old Testament, David and Goliath. Um, Israel and Armenia both share that commonality of being small nations uh, against uh, great, greater forces um, against them. And you just have to hit your mark. You have to be plucky and hit your mark once to be successful. Senator Stern, I know you want to have an opportunity to respond to Mr. Lenga as well. I, yeah, I, I, I'm really honored that and amazed that he's in here in Zoom and Mr. Lenga's owning the chat room too. So that's really impressive. Thanks for driving this conversation that way. And it's a tough who can disagree with you, sir? It's a, that's a very, that's a hard position because history seems to bear out your truth that the mighty and the well-armed always win. Um, but, you know, the source of the covenant that you were, you were talking about already that it goes back to that original covenant between uh, Abraham and uh, our maker and by the way, uh, sealed and and um, cemented, I would say, at Mount Ararat by Abraham himself. But that uh, that was a radical agreement to say that kings weren't in charge, and that righteousness and morality were actually the ruler. Um, and I don't know if that bears that out in terms of lives saved or lost. It's very hard to explain why people die unjustly. Um, but it's, to me, the interesting point is that I don't know how you define who the, the victor is, because uh, Baruch Diana met, you know, it's uh, blessed is the true judge. So I, I don't, may, it maybe doesn't provide much strategic value uh, in, a, in the current scenario where there's a real outnumbering or, um, and bring back any of the people you knew and love and lost, but it's, it, it, there's a rectification at some point. At some point, the truth is the truth, and right is right, and wrong is wrong, and those things can't be crushed or, or killed. So um, I, I would just say offer that slight counterpoint um, that we're all under God, 
and uh, one way or another, we'll, we'll, we'll meet him. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, it's heavy. Anyway, thank you for participating, David. Yeah, uh, thank you. And, you know, there's, um, I want to ask this one, there's two questions. Maybe we ask this one question and then we uh, end it on the, the last question. Um, social media, Jeremy asks, social media has played a role in helping to disseminate information from within Artsakh, but has it done more harm than good with respect to Azeri bots, et cetera, or more good than harm in pursuing hacktivist options to pursue justice, et cetera? Um, and you know, perhaps uh, Armin, Ellen, you guys can uh, address that about and explain maybe what the these bots, what it means by bots, because some may not be as familiar uh, with the current tech lingo. Armin, do you want to go first? Sure. So of course we've we've faced this um, immense disinformation campaign. I mean. Uh, war these days, of course, is on several dimensions, uh, notwithstanding the actual battlefield, there is the information and, and other sorts of warfare as well. And um, I think being open and transparent trumps um, any form of repression of uh, information um, in any case. And I think this war also puts into demonstration that fact that Armenia and Artsakh two beacons of freedom and democracy in the region fighting against uh, autocratic, dictatorial, uh, regimes with a genocidal intent. I think there is this other dimension that we need to keep in mind that Azerbaijan um, and Turkey keep their uh, populations repressed. Uh, no freedom of press, no freedom of uh, speech, uh, minorities repressed as well, um, and cultural monuments destroyed. Um, so I think under any circumstance, I would always err on the side of being open and transparent and sharing information from the ground as uh, devastating as it may be. I mean, right now we're seeing footage coming out of Artsakh of Armenians fleeing for their life and burning their homes behind them. Um, I mean, this is the if this is not any sign of desperation and call for assistance, I don't know what else is. Um, I mean, how much has how much good or bad it has done? I'll leave that for people to judge. But I personally think being open and transparent is key, um, despite the fact that Azerbaijan has deployed um, a sophisticated technology of creating this fake accounts or bots uh, that would be fighting and trying to intimidate. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there was intimidation campaign for this event as well for the organizers um, and uh, among others. Uh, I mean, we see a sudden spike of thousands of comments trying to uh, quench any form of discussion or open debate or rather it's a, it's, it's, it's a tactic of a repression. Uh, so we certainly need to combat that. And Facebook actually just a couple of weeks ago suspended thousands of uh, fake Azerbaijani bot accounts um, on its own platform. So this is something we need to continue to do, um, not just for the army Armenians, I think hate speech in general needs to be uh, addressed. And of course, as ANCA, we stand resolute in combating anti-Semitism, Armenophobia, and any other manifestation of hate. So um, this is something we need to join forces and make sure that uh, such practices have no space and place moving forward. Now, we, we're, we've run a little bit over, and I do want to give an opportunity for Serena to wrap up. Before we do, I want to ask a question. Um, Jordana, Ellen, if you can answer it. How can young Armenian and Jewish activists work more closely to fight for justice. And I know Armin, you've touched upon it and we all have in various ways, but as a last word, I'll, I'll pass it on to you. Jordana or Ellen. Um, I was just gonna say that, you know, at the at Holocaust Museum LA, when we talk about genocide, we reference the Armenian genocide. And I think what's so important today is for us to come together in education in community and working together I know um, the city of Los Angeles can oftentimes feel both very big and very small. And I think having just this community presence of these two communities in the city is a great way to create space for dialogue and conversation. Um, I know at the museum, we've worked with the Glendale Library to bring exhibitions there to the community. And I think having more dialogue, more conversations like this, working together, meeting one another, getting to know one another, finding common ground, breaking bread, these are all great um, opportunities. I would say if you're a young person and who's listening right now, you know, pick up the phone, call your, an organization of the other group, um, see different ways that you can volunteer and work together and just learn from one another. And that's really, I think, the first step. I'd just like to add, I think that this isn't an Armenian issue. Obviously, this is a human rights issue. Um, I think the Armenian community has a tendency to continue to talk 
in an echo chamber um, and the partnerships that we have with uh, other organi organizations are absolutely critical. The Holocaust Museum of LA is one, um, whereas the Holocaust Museum, for example, in Houston has a similar partnership with that community over there. Um, I think it's absolutely critical for us to take the projects that we have and not have it just be a partnership on paper, uh, but a collaborative effort um, as you are uh, implementing that project and program. So um, it's not just uh, having a discussion with Paul, but how you actually incorporate um, human rights organizations um, and other ethnic groups into your, your discussion, your project. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think that um, what we've learned is that there's a lot that we share as a people, as communities, um, and just outside of the Jewish-Armenian relationship with others as well. Um, and we have to all stand together because in the words of, uh, you know, Martin Luther King, uh, injustice here is a threat to justice everywhere, uh, or injustice tolerated in any place is a threat to justice everywhere. So um, I, wanna, I want to thank you all for your time, your precious time, especially as um, we are closely watching and monitoring what is happening in Armenia. In our talk, I want to thank uh, Senator Stern um, for his uh, availability. We had about 42 questions that came in, and we only were able to answer four. That just tells you how much interest there is in um, people wanting to uh, hear answers about questions they have about this conflict, about the relationship, how we can do better, and how we can grow to be a better society through our activism. Um, again, thank you for this opportunity, Serena, to Jewish World Watch, to Armenian National Committee of America Western Region, and um, to the Holocaust Museum of Los Angeles. If you have had not, if you've been living in Los Angeles and have not visited this institution, I urge you to do so. Um, and it has been for a number of years the starting point for the Armenian March for Justice, um, which is no coincidence. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to Serena. Serena, you get to have the last word. Thank you so much, Artie. Uh, I want to I want to thank all of the panelists again for everything that you shared today. It was such a rich and insightful conversation. Um, and as you were all talking about the importance of collaboration and standing together, I remembered that when Jewish World Watch started about 16 years ago, um, one of our, our co-founder who, who we talk about all the time, Rabbi Harold Schulweis, was standing at the front of the room and standing next to him was Archbishop Hofnan Derderian. And I think that says a lot about the history of this organization uh, and, and the present of this organization. And you know, when, when we see what's happening and um, the, the narratives that are being perpetuated, uh, we, we do have to remind ourselves what is the truth, what is morality, what is justice. And I want to say that when this panel was put together, it was truly overwhelmed with, um, with the illustriousness of it. Uh, you guys individually have been relentless in your search to create a world that is more truthful and more just. Uh, and um, I think it's incredible that, um, you know, that this is our generation up here talking about these issues. And you guys are, are the leaders that we've been waiting for. And although things feel very uncertain in this moment, I believe with all of you at the helm um, that this country and this world is going in the right direction. Uh, and and um, I'm, so, I'm just so appreciative to, to end the week in this way with this conversation. Um, we at Jewish World Watch look forward to continuing to partnering with all of you. I hope everyone watching today was also inspired to take action. Uh, you can go on our website and um, visit jewishworldwatch.org impact, sign up for conversations and events in the coming weeks, especially uh, those that are named participate with a purpose because we can't do the amazing programming like this without your support. So go on today and, and you can also um, go on and see the letter that was signed by over 80 Jewish leaders from Los Angeles alone standing in support of the Armenian community. Thank you for joining all of us today uh, and, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>